Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, too, would like to um, express my sincere gratitude for a friendship I've had with a classmate, Mr. Israel, who is uh, going to be leaving this committee and leaving Congress to go on to a new chapter in his life. And as an author, I'm sure there might be many, many chapters coming in your life. I'd also like to thank... Um, as many books as a gentleman from Utah. Yeah, we two, we'll be down to one author, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Um, I would also very much um, uh, share your appreciation and all the work that our staff does together, the way in which they work together to um, uh, make uh, our jobs uh, much easier. And as you pointed out, there's a lot of work for them um, coming down the pike here. So I would like to uh, thank the staff for what they've done today and what they're going to be doing tomorrow. But Mr. Chairman, I would also uh, like to thank you and your staff and working with me and our staff for such a collaborative approach. This subcommittee has a very challenging portfolio of issues, and I really want to commend the chair's efforts to find solutions in another difficult budget year. However, the majority's failure to adopt a budget resolution and its piecemeal approach to the subcommittee's uh, two, three OBs allocations this year made our work more difficult. More, however, such a lack of transparency has placed the entire committee at a disadvantage and has pushed us far from what I consider regular order, regular order in having our allocations at the beginning of the appropriations process. The FY 2017 subcommittee allocation, as been pointed out, is $64 million less than the fiscal year 2016 enacted level. And that means many of the needs of important programs vital to protecting our nation's natural and cultural resources will not be met as they far outpace a stagnant allocation. With this constraint top line number, it's difficult choices had to be made. And sadly, important programs vital to protecting our nation's natural and cultural resources did not receive adequate funding. Most significant programmatic cuts were in the Environmental Protection Agency, which is going to receive $164 million less than the FY 2016 enacted level. This will cut the impact of the agency's ability to protect human health, the health of our environment to ensure clean air and clean water for our families and for our children. This year, the critical need for the EPA was unmistakably uh, pointed out as our nation watched a tragedy unfold in Flint, Michigan, where children were poisoned by the lead in their drinking water. So I find it difficult to reconcile the cuts recommended in this bill with the public health challenges faced by this country. Flint is an accumulation of years of weakening the EPA through budget cuts, over-reliance on state agencies to manage federal environmental laws, and our communities deserve and expect their government to provide clean water and basic public health protections. The residents, the children of Flint, were betrayed by their state government, and to this day, they still do not have safe drinking water available from the tap in their house or their school. The levels provided in this bill for the state revolving funds are inadequate to deal with the decaying infrastructure in our nation, no less the emergency in Flint. So I look to work with the chair, with all the members of the House, to uh, improve those numbers. And that's why it's appropriate and imperative for this committee to work to find those additional funds. Flint is an emergency designation. While this bill does not provide funds specifically for Flint, I want to thank the chair for the language in the bill that provides additional authority for states to offer debt relief within areas of elevated uh, levels of lead in their drinking water. This is a good thing, Mr. Chair, but there's still more work that needs to be done. I'm very proud of this subcommittee's nonpartisan approach by addressing the uh, issues facing our Native American brothers and sisters. And while I'm pleased that this bill re uh, recommends an increase of $443 million for programs cl critical to Indian Country, I would be remiss if I did not point out that even with this increase, funding for Native American programs is still $172 million less than the administration's request. But, Mr. Chair, we work together to do our best. Nonetheless, this bill, by, by working together, will keep our commitment to providing Native American students with safe schools, 
that are conductive to full learning and fully uh, funds contract support costs so that tribes are not penalized for exercising their self-determination rights. This bill also recommends $3.9 million or a 12% increase of the subcommittee's allocation for wildland fires. But once again, the majority has failed to adopt a very common sense reform bill championed by uh, Chairman Simpson's wildfire disaster fund building. And every single member of this subcommittee is a co-sponsor of that bill. So Mr. Simpson, we stand with you to bring it to the floor. But once again, the majority has not done that. Uh, citing committee jurisdiction, we don't, uh, we're not able to do it in uh, here. Jurisdictional issues aside, uh, however, did not hinder the majority for including harmful legislative writers. And I must express my deep concern and disappointment with the 29 bipartisan writers in this bill. It's veto bait. Such provisions that seek to turn back protections for endangered species, restrict control of greenhouse gases, gas emissions, undermine clean water and clean air protections. They do not belong in this bill, and their effect would be to undermine important environmental laws, endanger public health and safety, and deny that climate change is having an impact on our planet. However, I am very happy to say that one of the bright spots in this bill is the continued support for our National Park Service's Centennial Initiative. The bill recommends an additional $800 million for the Centennial. These funds will be used to strengthen the foundation of, <clears throat> of services and make essential infrastructure investments. I'm also pleased that there's an additional $3 million provided for the Civil Rights Initiative grant program, funding's included, and grants and aids to historical black colleges and universities. Finally, I would like to thank the chairman for working to resurrect Save America's Treasures program. This program fund preservation of national significance site structures and artifacts. <clears throat> I am proud that we were able to restart this important program and I will work dil diligently to make sure that's included in the final bill. I look forward to working together with you, Mr. Chair, and all the committee members on an appropriations process to produce a responsible bill that both parties support. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your courtesy of an opening statement, and I yield back.